I wanted to ask you about uh, when you're talking about you're talking about the relating to to our mothers, which I thought was you know powerful and strange. Does that have to do with the term superego? These structures that we have around our primary object, or is that a separate concept? Uh, it so as far as par- parsing out all these words and stuff. So Freud's structural model of the psyche. So that word "structural" is in there, and it, it, this it's used a little differently here. The structural model being id ego superego. You're referring to the the superego portion of Freud's structural model of the psyche. The superego in in that in that model, the superego is. You know that that part of the idea where where morals and ideals and and the and the shoulds and shouldn'ts of our psyche are coming from and and that it is a uh, unlike the id which is the more the just pre-existing energetic instincts and drives and impulses the superego is a is a structure that is formed in the psyche based on experiences that we have with our environment with our primarily with our parents but obviously with teachers with the society we live in we form these structures that are like if you if you think of them as these energetic structures that that are a principle or an idea or and so then we orient to that as an authority so if you if you have a structure that says that you shouldn't kill a human it's like okay that becomes the structure that your psyche adheres to and anchors in tracks references so now when you're uh, when someone cuts you off in traffic and your id says, hit the gas and ram that son of a bitch and kill him, your ego is is presented with that urge, that drive, that instinct, which makes sense to the id, you know, because the id's living in this very animalistic world that doesn't have morals isn't considering other isn't considering layers of of reality or layers of importance etc that it's just reactive right the the ego is presented with the id's demand the id's agenda and freud's idea was that is counterbalanced hope hopefully <laughs> counterbalanced in a in a way that is culturally appropriate by the superego and the superego affects the ego and has its agenda and the superego says you shall not kill another human and so now the ego has conflicting information and so freud's idea of psychic conflict that we are, we humans live in conflict constantly because we have the id saying one thing and then the superego is, is this idea of the social principle, right? This idea of society or civilization. And, and of course, his idea was that humans are not innately civilized. We're wild, we're primitive. Our id is not civilized. And if we're going to civilize it, we have to tame it and it is tamed via the interaction between id and superego that occurs in the mind and specifically in, in what he's calling the ego part of the mind. So one way to put it is that, that it often gets put is that the barometer of mental health is how well is the ego holding up against the forces from below, so to speak, meaning the id, and the forces from above, meaning the superego. And 
and how is it integrating and balancing those things? And so there's a whole list of maladies that would be symptomatic of not enough uh, of an of the ego's failure to deal with the id and its demands. And there's a different set of maladies that are symptomatic of the ego's failure to deal with the superego's demand. So someone who suffers terrible shame and guilt, for example, they are over, their ego is being overpowered by their superego. Someone who uh, has impulse control problems and acts out in ways that, that are socially inappropriate, their ego is failing to deal with the id's demands. And obviously, there can be a jumping back and forth. Freud's structural model is that the superego is one of the three categories, and the structures that exist in the superego are structures that are formed in the same kind of way that I'm talking about we form we form structures that are that that can be identities, and so it get it it really starts to make have some stuff make sense. It's like in a minute here, I'll ask if I've come anywhere close to answering your question, but let me just say something else to this. But not yet. It's really right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so we're we have all these structures, and we the more the more coherent and strong and sort of fixed the structure is in our psyche, the more enduring and powerful it is. And th there's a real difference if, if, I, if I am relating to my mother and then I have this, this structure in my psyche that is mother, that's different than a structure in my psyche that says you know, th that is some, let's say, moral principle or some ideal. If I object relate to that as self, for example, if at some point I say, you know what, I'm going to shift, and of course this always happens unconsciously, but it's, okay, I can't trust my mother anymore or my mother I think is useless to, to me now as far as where I want to go, uh, you know, I feel too abandoned or hurt by my mother, et cetera. But this idea of, I, I know for me and my psyche to a certain degree, it was of being world champion, right? Or of being a good person or of being a Democrat or a Republican or of being a hero um, or of being kind or of being tough, it's like we lock on to structures in the superego that are, again, ideals, they're morals, they're principles. And, if you, and to the extent that you do that, you become an ideologue, right? So, you, so you, you start having this moral superiority, moral stance, idealist, fundamentalist, fanatic, and whether you're a fanatic about being kind or whether you're a fanatic about being world champion or whether you're a fanatic about, you know, being whatever, it, it's, you, you start literally experiencing selfhood as that. J just one more little concept that, again, I'll go into later. But the idea of cathecting, the word cathecting means to invest libidinal energies, which means id energies, to invest inner id energies in an object. So what is the object? Well, if you invest id energies in a superego structure, it feels awesome, right? And you become a fanatic crusader of that ideal because your libidinal energies get to move and run and have their expression, which feels awesome. And they're invested in that that idea. And so anytime you are expressing, fighting for that idea, you get a charge out of it, right? You get off on it. You get a kick out of it. It feels right and good. 
because the general idea, according to Freud's structural model, is that the id is where life really is, right? The actual felt sense of aliveness and satisfaction and hunger and desire and aggression, and fear and, and all these actual experiences versus a bunch of concepts is the energies of the id, the, the libidinal energies. And so cathecting means investing libidinal energies in an object. And if we can invest libidinal energies in an object and then actually get to take a run at that object, it feels awesome. We feel motivated. And this plays out every second of every day. If you wake up in the morning and you're tired and you'd rather just lay around, but in your ego, you have invested in your job, your work, whether that means not getting fired or whether that means the actual project you're working on or whatever, then you mobilize your libidinal energies towards that object and you get out of bed even when you're dead tired. If you wake up in the morning and your libidinal energies cannot be invested in and you know moved and expressed towards an object that you are cathected to, then you will struggle. You will be depressed. You will be anxious. You will feel a lack of motivation, a lack of meaning, a lack of strength, a lack of aggression, a lack of courage, a lack of satisfaction. And dragging yourself out of bed anyway, dragging yourself to that job anyway, will suck. And again, we have an epidemic of this and we aren't looking at it in this kind of way. We've, we've, we've left Freud's structural model by the wayside. And, you know, again, I'm not saying that it, the model's perfect or complete or something, but the general principles of it are, are it seems obvious to me, are, are just so important. And we, and we aren't even considering the, the fundamentals of it in, you know, we're just, it's just, you know, what kind of anti antidepressant do they need to take? Or we try to address it in all these ways that don't include this idea of libidinal energies and cathexis and, and object relating. And, and because we've left the idea of structure completely behind. And we think it's about, um, you know, well, that person that, that is depressed or doesn't want to get out of bed, um, you know, they're just lazy or, or, you know, we need to get them to think about it this way instead of that way. And, you know, and it's just like, it's a deeper issue than that. It's structural. I find myself saying that all the time when I'm talking with other therapists, uh, especially when I'm, when I'm in a supervisory role with other therapists where it's like, what's the structural issue here? You know, the client's presenting these symptoms. What's your sense of the structural issue? What's the structure? What's going on? Why are they having this trouble? Again, to get on my little soapbox about therapy, it's like coaching is different than counseling, is different than psychotherapy. And psychotherapy, at least originally, was about structure. Psychotherapy was a treatment method when counseling and coaching failed. If a person's got something going on where they, they're not able to function properly and simply coaching them, simply teaching them, simply explaining to them what they should be doing, explaining to them the correct way to do it, the correct way to be, uh, even threatening consequence, when that doesn't work, when coaching, counseling, teaching, consequences, etc., doesn't work, the idea is perhaps there's a structural issue. Perhaps there's a reason that isn't just stupidity. Perhaps there's a reason that isn't just bad attitude. Perhaps there's a structural issue going on in this person that makes them literally unable, not unwilling, but unable to function correctly. Obviously in our, in our current culture, when people talk of systemic issues, right? It's that same argument. It's saying, listen, 
there, there can be a bunch of quote unquote bad behavior, whether that's bad behavior by cops or bad behavior by uh, a particular population and whatever you want to call quote unquote bad behavior, but meaning, meaning a failure to thrive in a certain way. You know, it's, is it bad attitudes? Is it, is it simply education or is there a deeper, deeper structural issue going on? Right. So this principle plays out in a lot of different ways. And, uh, to come back to the idea of structure and the idea that, that these objects are in our psyches, uh, it's this very complex thing and we can orient to and anchor in and identify with, with anything. We can do it with anything. We can, it can be mother, it can be uh, an, I- an ideal, it can be an inanimate object, a, a child. The idea is that children tend to shift from mother to what they call a transitional object and they start to anchor in their teddy bear or in their blankie. And, and looking at that whole f- world of structures and objects is the, in psychotherapy is the world of uh, structural psychotherapy uh, and, and object relations theory. And I'll just end with uh, when you come back to the physical body, it's the same thing. It's how come you, how come you keep slicing um, when you, when you hit the golf ball, how come, how come that keeps happening? How come you have the yips? How come, you know, you, your uh, knees are hurting when you go running? How come you're weak in certain parts of your body? It might be a structural issue. It might not be train harder. It might not be more explaining of the proper golf swing. It might be something where more explaining of the golf swing and more of an understanding of how you should swing the golf club doesn't, it, that might, if that's not working, it's like, wait, is there a deeper structural issue? Do you have stuff going on in your fascia, in your tensegrity that is, makes you unable to perform the function. So again, as far as all these types of work lining up in my mind, it was like, Oh my God, this idea of structure, structural body work, structural psychotherapy. Why are we not looking at structure more? We're so hyper focused on just intellectual cognitive understanding and understanding it this way versus that believing this or that saying it this way or that. And again, to slide dangerously into the political sphere, um, you know, we're talking about words. We're talking about this words. You know, you know, you shouldn't say this word anymore. You shouldn't say that. You know, we got to use this word now. This is the polit- politically correct term, um, w- which are all really ideas, right? Those are ideas. They're not entities. They're not. They shouldn't be identities we should be looking at what's the actual structure, what's the actual intent, what's the actual deeper meaning, and not be so hyperfixated on the surface cognitive verbal idea level. But again, it, it's symptomatic of this intense orientation from our intellect and uh, acting like we can just come in with ideas about what should be how we should label things, how we should not label things, and uh, and think we're just going to sort of transcend structure, physical structure, mental structure, emotional structure, et cetera. I think it's just a good call out. It's kind of the structure of the podcast has been laying out these different tenets, but it's kind of those overarching themes or that overarching theme we're talking about of structure hasn't been laid out like that. So I thought that was kind of cool. Ah, good. Um, yeah, I had to look up cathexis while you were talking. I never heard that term before. Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's like, you know, I, I think cathexis is, you know, you could, you could make an argument that cathexis is the most important thing in, in the world. Like it drives everything what someone's connected to is absolutely the very most important thing. And, and to be as deep, you know, into all this stuff as you are, for example, 
and then you having to look up cathexis is is just sort of a <laughs> you know well it's it's a i feel like it's a term for something that is a quest right like this there's this feeling that we have of when we're doing something we enjoy versus when we're not and to to have a word for a way in which that's not just preference that's not just uh, attitude that's like a primal drive and a like an energy that is what fuels anything is is helpful you know and i think it's you kind of got at it a little bit we talked about imaginal forces and archetypes that they're just these things outside of time that we can hook into that are representative of that internal drive and when those two things align i think it's when people create stuff that's never been created right that there's this if you find a uh, passion and the energy of these different dimensions we're talking about that that's that looking for that overlap is a pretty foundational uh search for someone you can you could say that for example nietzsche's primary idea was about cathexis you know he wasn't i don't know that he was using that word but the idea was humanity is crippling itself with ideals and and his you know his genealogy of morals you know is is one of the ways that he addresses that right that that book because he's saying that to cripple yourself meaning to live by a, a moral to live by the superego to live by an idea and do so by repressing denying castrating crippling yourself in relation to your id that he was saying humanity was doing that and he was saying it's going to be disastrous and he was saying we've got to turn around and look inward and when we look inward what we're going to encounter is our id and we got to keep going anyway and that's going to get dark and ugly and fierce and scary but that the truly moral the truly superior human arrives at a transcendence of the id not a successful repression of it and again that concept that idea that i just stated our current society has lost touch with we're literally doing the the other thing we're demanding from a moral superior stance that all id activity that isn't in perfect alignment with the current cultural idea of what would be best is demonized as opposed to an attempt at understanding harnessing integrating transforming transmuting the id right and i think i think part of just the whole move away from both of the like so nietzsche's structure and freud's is that there was a moral superiority aspect to both of them or like there was a this and only this is right and i think in postmodernism those kinds of stances were easier to reject because there's a felt sense of like the person's the theorist personality behind it and the like with nietzsche the, the whole idea of like the name for the person who's done what you said is an ubermensch right the person who's successfully gone through that and the, the, at the end of everything he said is like, well, that's me, you know, and the, that's, that's easy to throw aside because the, the personality can override what's true about it. And so with all of this, it's like important to, it's all about self-work. So these people that were able to give structure to the self-work they had done and give descriptions to the things that they had figured out is valid and using that to inform a more cohesive, more total picture is valid. And you don't have to take the personality with the idea or with the, the concept. Yeah. And I think that's something we've been talking about just on this too, that there's obviously you have a personality. Obviously I have a personality and there are things we say from that. And there are things that we say from something beyond that. 
And it's obviously up to whoever listening to distinguish those or differentiate those. But I think there's at least hopefully an awareness of that dynamic. Yeah, that it's such a tricky thing, obviously. But I, I do think that like that's like the value of the the integral idea of transcending and including that doesn't get I mean it does, but it could always be fleshed out more fully that anything any of us says is partial truth, right? Anything any of us puts into words is partial truth and has to be seen as that and has to be held as that because to, to give it more significance than that is a slippery slope and it doesn't invalidate the attempt, but it, the, like you said, it's just a balancing act between having this, this incomplete representation of a complete truth that isn't fully understood yet. In Christianity, the first commandment, you know, I, th- I think is is speaking to that. It's saying the original impulse, the true, the absolute, whatever you want to call it, is what's important. And any word, any symbol, any image, any concept is a, you know, is a is a diminishment of that. And that obviously life is is just a series of diminishments, right? As far as th- this idea that the further you go down into structure, the fur you, the more dense, the more unconscious, the further you are from that original source. But but the the my understanding of of the commandment is don't put any of those things before the original. You know, have an understanding that. That the first, the first sin, the the first mistake, is to think the concept, the word, the person, is the thing. So it's it's a it's a pretty deep kind of primary aspect to all this. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. But it's yeah, it's just it's so foundational that it's invisible. Yeah, right. So in the last 20 minutes here, do you want to talk about mirroring versus empathizing? (laughs) I feel like we don't even have to. I mean, it's like, it's a great podcast on object relating. And then also just the holding mirroring contact or the, you know, just the, these underlying practices or, uh, what would you call them methods that you use or these frameworks for your approach of like the actual work, you know? So we talked a little bit about holding last time and this one, like the context was to understand mirroring better. And I think it makes sense, but it makes sense. Like everything you're saying is what you're learning about yourself and the structure of how, how identity is built. And then anything you're mirroring is some part of that process, right? Is some, dimension of of that construction yeah exactly that the the shift from holding to mirroring and and empath holding involves empathy right so the shift from empathy to mirroring the shift from holding to mirroring if if we say holding empathy is is required for holding just like you're saying there mirroring with the shift to mirroring self comes into play which is why I went on that whole thing I went on is that is that when you when you shift from orienting and from orienting to anchoring to identity when identity when self comes into the picture that's where mirroring is so important because relationally for example when you mirror something to someone else, let's say, and mirroring to your own self is is eventually what the goal is. But but if we just talk about one human mirroring to another human, what's happening in that process is that there's a helping the helping the person's mind become aware of an experience that they're having. And the general idea is that is that we start out being aware as the experience 
And so we are lost in it. We're possessed by it. We're overcome by it. The physical experience, the emotional, the mental, the imaginal, the subtle, we're lost in it. We're just aware as it. So if it's a good experience, hey, it's all good, you know, life's great. But, but as soon as it's not good, we're in real trouble. So initially, we're drowning in it, right? And we need help. We need holding, meaning we need support. The swimming analogy works well. It's like if, you're, if you find yourself in a body of water and you can't swim in it, there's just panic, you know, and flailing and, and this dr drowning that's happening. And so you need support. And if simply someone calling out from, from the boat or from shore instructions on how to swim are typically not going to work, right? The person's not even going to hear it. They're just going to be in a panic and they're flailing and they're going to go under. And so they need support. So let's say someone jumps in the water and swims out to them. The jumping in the water is a good analogy for empathizing. If you're going to actually leave shore or leave the boat and get in that water that that person is drowning in, you're going you're gonna to empathize. You're going to join them in the experience. And again, if we talk about like the person's field, in, the, in a previous episode, we talked about the, the atmosphere, right? Your field is the atmosphere you live in. So in this analogy, I'm saying if the water is the field is the atmosphere that the person's trying to deal with, that the person might be drowning in. To empathize is to join them in that field, join them in that vibration, empathize with them, feel it with them, which is very different than to stand outside of it, right? And that's the difference between sympathy and empathy. To sympathize is to stay outside and you can still be caring. You can still be trying to offer instructions. You can even be trying to throw a a life preserver or, or, you know, go for help. But that's different than to actually jump in that water. So to jump in the water is to empathize. And, and empathy is great, but simply drowning along with someone only goes so far. You know, misery loves company. We'd all rather be drowning with someone than alone. The next step after empathy would be support right? To actually get support that starts to prevent the drowning. So again, this is holding. Holding provides support. The person starts to feel held. The person starts to feel supported. And when that happens, the panic starts to subside. They start orienting to the support and hopefully eventually anchoring in that support. And so great, now they're being held, now they're being supported, now they're not freaking out, they're not drowning. Now they're just kind of maybe even relaxing into the supportedness. But now they're completely dependent on that support. And let's say it's the person that jumped in the water and swam out and says, I got you, I got you. Calm down, calm down, I got you, right? I can swim in this water. And if you can't, then relax into the support that I'm providing you because I can swim in this. So what, is, what does that mean for one person to be able to swim in a particular water, to be able to swim in a certain dimension, a certain experience, right? A certain atmosphere. What it means for the one person to be able to swim in that means that they can maintain a sense of self and tolerate that experience and so the the difference between tolerating i mean between having a sense of self in it and just being in it and surviving is is a huge shift when self starts to show up for you in an experience it all changes you're no longer dependent on the other person if we, if we use this example of the, of the person swimming out there, you're no longer dependent on them. You start having your own supportedness. You start having autonomy. You start having a coherent sense of self that isn't just 
object relating with this other thing. And I could, you know, go on and on about the implications of that. But, but again, selfhood is this huge difference. What facilitates the formation, if you will, of self, right? What creates it? What facilitates it? What, what fosters a, a person showing up as a self in the midst of an experience? Mirroring. Mirroring is what facilitates it. So if I jump into water with someone, swim out to them, am able to, if I'm able to swim in that water, <laughs> which I can only swim in some waters, not others, if I can swim in that water and I can maintain a sense of self, then I can empathize with them, hold them, and if they can settle into my holding and calm down enough for us to relate enough for me to mirror them, which means I'm going to see them, even though they can't see them. I'm going to see them. I'm going to see their mind. And again, we can get deeper into, am I, am I mirroring to their ego mind or to their conscious mind? Ideally both, but, but it'll vary. Um, but if I can mirror to their mind the experience then what I'm doing is I'm helping their mind show up in the midst of that experience. Because when we are drowning, when we are lost, when we, when we don't have a sense of self in an experience, what has happened is we've lost touch with our, with our sense of self via our mind and, we, and we've become lost in the experience. It's like being blackout drunk or being asleep or being... You know, it's unconsciousness. We're just the experience. We're lost in it. It's like being in the, in the dark, you know, and you can't see. So to mirror is to shine that light, to help that person become back in touch with their mind and be in touch with that experience at the same time. You're healing that split. You're you're bringing your attention to the experience and the person's mind simultaneously. You're reflecting it, which is the mirroring part, obviously. You're reflecting it, and the person starts to show up in their mind. The, the way this would play out in the swimming analogy, you know, would tend to be something like, I've got you, I've got you, I've got you. That's the holding. Calm down, I've got you. I can swim in this, I'm here. Look at me, orient to me. I've got you. And then when it shifts to mirroring, it would be, for example, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. There's a you. There's a you. You still exist. You're still here. You're still who you are. You're going to be okay. Even though this is happening, even though you're experiencing this, I still see you. I still see you. And the person starts to show up in their mind again, even in the midst of that experience. That's what mirroring does. And that's how mirroring is different than simply empathizing. With mirroring, the other part is still happening, right? The container is still there. The holding empathetic container. And it's like adding an element to it. Yes, ideally. Right, right. If you want to learn more about the Dimension Approach, please visit dimensionapproach.com. <laughs>